Paul's letter to the family of followers in Ephesus. You'll notice right away that I try to avoid using the word church because it wasn't a church. It's certainly not a church the way we think of church. It was a family of followers in all likelihood meeting in home churches, home gatherings. And, and it turns out that this is one of those rich, rich letters that we want to absorb. I encourage you to read it over and over and in the coming years to keep coming back to it, memorize some of these really important ideas, these scripture passages that we find in Ephesians. It, this came about with a, a group of friends of mine down in Charleston, uh, a Bible study I attend down there, asked me to do an introduction to Ephesians. And, and I was delighted to do it because, as I said, this is one of my favorites. When I was born again, back at the age 38, I had the opportunity to go through a Bible, a one-on-one uh, Bible discipleship study with James Orders, who is no longer living, no longer living here. And, uh, and, and we went through all these scripture memorizations and, and, and I am, I have a lot of faults and I have a lot of weaknesses, but I'm, I have a gift of memorizing scripture. So as we went through all these various passages, he said, I want you to memorize the prologue to the gospel of John verses one through 14. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning through him, all things were made without him. Nothing has been made that has been made. I still have that memorized. But then he asked me to go and, and memorize the prologue to Ephesians chapter one, verses one through 13, plus or minus. And I did. And I wanted to cuss him the whole time I was memorizing it because it was so hard to memorize because it's so rich in all of its language. It doesn't flow well from a memory standpoint. And it's interestingly enough, when you read this prologue, it's all one sentence. It's as if Paul is just bursting forth with this incredible praise and clarity about what God the Father is doing through Jesus in this world. So I love talking about the book of Ephesians. And what I want to do first is just to set it up because context and culture is so helpful to understand so that we really get a feel for what Paul is doing. Where, where is he writing this from? And how did he end up there? And then we'll talk for a moment about this actual city of Ephesus so that you just have an idea of, of what all the context and culture for this is. And then we'll move to just some highlights in the, in, the, in the letter. And I know you're going to see some things that are familiar to you, but maybe you'll see them in a different light today. So where is Paul? Paul is in Rome. He's not in prison. He's under house arrest. How did he end up there? Well, we can read about this in Acts chapter, and I'm going to give you just a couple of highlights on that. If you really start in Acts 21 and run, read it all the way through Acts 28, you see Paul's journey towards the end of his life as he make, ends up being in Rome this first time. He went back a second time. He's in Rome now because he, he was arrested, falsely accused in Jerusalem of taking Gentiles into the inner court of the Temple Mount, which he did not do. But when he was arrested, there was such a brouhaha about it that it, it caused such a stir that he then found out that the Jewish authorities were plotting to kill him. So he had the, he told the Roman guard, the Roman guard in charge, the centurion, had him sent to Caesarea by the sea. Now, if you ever go to Israel, be sure to go to Caesarea Maritima, which means by the sea. It's Herod's city. Herod the Great City is fantastic, beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. And the ruins there are still such that you can get a real good idea of what it may have looked at. We'll come back to we'll come back to um, to Caesarea and some of these other ideas, but he's there, he's in Caesarea for two years. Felix is the governor for this region at this point. Pilate's gone. Right now we're talking, and during this time we're around sixty A.D., sixty-two A.D., right in there. Felix is the governor, and he's he's like so many of these others. He's he's a bad character, and he he has Paul come before him, listens to the case. Not a, not a formal trial, sends him back into his room, into his room or prison cell or however you want to look at it. I don't think it was a, a, an actual prison cell in Caesarea. But he, we read in the scripture that he wanted to get a bribe from Paul or maybe Paul's supporters. And so he just kept him there languishing for two years. And then his time is up and Festus comes in and he hands it over to Festus. Festus is the new governor and he knows he has to do something about this. 
So he brings this, he, br he brings the trial. And let me just show you this passage, from the two passages from Acts 25 that give us the setting for how Paul ended up in Rome. This is Luke writing. Luke is one of Paul's constant companions. And we see that Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. That's uh, Acts 25.1. But let's pick it up at Acts, Acts 25.6. After spending eight or 10 days with them, that would be the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem, Festus went down to Caesarea. The next day he convened the court and ordered Paul be brought before him. When Paul came in, the Jews, the Jewish authorities who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. They brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove them because they weren't true. Now, just as a fun little Bible nerd fact, when you see that, that Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem and the Jews came down from Jerusalem to Caesarea, whenever you approach, Jerusalem is up on a beautiful mountaintop, big, tall hilltop, if you want to say. So the, in the Jewish mind, when you went to Jerusalem, you were always going up. And when you left Jerusalem, you were always going down. No matter that perhaps your final destination may be a higher elevation in Jerusalem, when you went up to Jerusalem, you came down from Jerusalem. So here we have Festus decides to convene this court. Verse 8, then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, very politically minded, said to Paul, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand before me there on these charges? Well, Paul knows that if he goes back to Jerusalem, they will assassinate him. They'll figure out a way to kill him. So Paul answered, and remember, Paul's a Roman citizen, so he has rights that other Jews wouldn't have, or the normal person wouldn't have. I am now standing before Caesar's court, where I ought to be tried. I have not done anything wrong to the Jews, as you, your, as you yourself know very well. There was no evidence. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Every Roman had the right to appeal to Caesar. Now we see the, the consequences of that appealing. Verse 12, after Festus had conferred with his council, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. And that is what happens when a Roman citizen appeals to Caesar. He gets to go to Rome, and now he's going to wait to have an opportunity to go before the emperor. The emperor at this point is Nero, who is growing more and more insane as, as the years go by. But he's, all of these emperors took the name Caesar, but it's Nero. So if you pick up Acts 25 and you read it all the way through to Acts 28, you'll see his his journey to get to Rome. And it was an arduous journey. It was fraught with all kinds of problems, shipwrecked, marooned on the island of Malta, almost died. It's an interesting story, but I just want to show you the last bit of Acts, Luke telling us exactly how, what happened at the end, Acts 28, 16, when we, Luke and Paul and whoever else may have been traveling with him, when we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. You see, Paul is in Rome. He is under house arrest. He's not in prison. Even though the letters that he wrote from this setting in Rome are called the prison epistles, that would be Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, uh, Philemon. He wasn't in prison. He was under house arrest. He was in a rented house that he, in all likelihood, had to pay for himself. We don't know how much his freedom was, whether he could leave the house, but he always had a Roman guard right next to him. It was called light chain. He was under light chain. He may have actually been chained like you might chain a briefcase to your hand. He may have been chained to the guard. Probably not, if he was, probably not 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But that guard, his job was to get this prisoner to Nero within an hour whenever Nero summoned him. And that could be at any point. And as we know, it went on for two years, and he was never summoned before Nero on that particular time. Three or four or five years later, he ends up back in jail in Rome. This time he's in the Mamertine prison, which is a dungeon 
I mean, he is a, he is, this is the worst of the worst. And he does ultimately go before Nero, who at this point is, a, is truly mad. And as a Roman citizen, he cannot be crucified. So he has his head cut off. But in this situation, he's in a rented house in Rome, spending the next two years, seeing people, having Jews and friends come in to see him, fellow Christians come in to see him. And so he writes this letter to the family of followers in this city called Ephesus, modern day Turkey. Ephesus had a population of about 250,000. In Ephesus, you had the temple of Diana slash Artemis. One's a Greek name for that God. The other one's a Roman name for that God. It was magnificent. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Un, but you should Google it and look up some pictures of it. You also had a stadium there, a theater stadium that held the seat of 25,000 people. Now, I live in Greenville most of the time. There's no, there's no stadium or, or coliseum or theater here that seats 25,000, nowhere close to it. My other home is in Charleston. There's, no, there's nothing like it there. Columbia doesn't have it. Rarely do you see this, and it's right there in Ephesus. Ephesus is one of the top three cities in the Roman Empire behind Rome. You had Alexandria, which is down in Egypt. You had Ephesus, and you had Antioch in Syria. And if you read your Bibles at all, you'll know that Paul's home church was Antioch. So Paul has a keen eye as to where to travel, where to spend time, where to invest his time to further the kingdom of God. And he understands Ephesus is a major city, the crown jewel of the Roman Empire. There was also a, uh, the, uh, the, the temple to Domitian, who at this later time was the emperor. And this temple was four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens. And you should look that up. At, Ephesus is a major place, major city. And Paul spends two and a half years there, training up men to follow in his footsteps. So now he's writing back to Ephesus. As a matter of fact, John the Apostle, the beloved Apostle John, spent his later part of his life in Ephesus. And we don't know for sure. One story says he brought Mary with him to Ephesus, and she died in Ephesus, and Ephesus claims her burial site there. The other story is he waited until Mary died. Remember, Jesus had asked him to look after Mary uh, after the crucifixion, and which he did, took her into his household. So the other story is that he stayed in Jerusalem until Mary died, and then he relocated to Ephesus. Ephesus is a big city. If I haven't gotten that across to you by now, certainly understand this is no little outpost. This is no little village. This is a, this is a major city, and Paul and many other apostles invested a lot of time in Ephesus. So there we have the setting. He's in Rome under house arrest. He's writing back to this family of followers predominantly Gentile, and the layout of the letter, it sort of lays out like this. Chapters one through three is the, is the calling of the disciple. Chapters four through six is the conduct of the disciple. And chapter six, starting at verse 10 to the end, is the conflict of the disciple. That's where you get the spiritual warfare, the put on the full armor of God. Chapters one through three, Paul is establishing the calling for these Gentile Jew, these Gentile Christians. He's saying, you are in Christ. And when you read that first prologue in, in, in Ephesians, you'll see in Christ, in him, in him, in Christ, in him. He's saying, you are in the kingdom. You're no second rate citizen in the kingdom of God. Just because you're Gentile and not Jew, you're as equal and he makes that very clear. He is saying in these first three chapters, you are secure in your um, status in the kingdom. And then in, in chapter four through six, verse 10, he then talks about how you conduct yourselves based on that calling, how you live it out. Who you are in Christ is the first three chapters, how you live with this identity in the next four, five, and the beginning of six. And wouldn't it be good for all of us if we actually lived our calling, if we understood our position in the kingdom, that we are in the kingdom. If we're born again, if we surrender our life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit indwells us, we're in the kingdom. How would it affect your day-to-day -day life if you lived with that awareness? Well, if I'm right off the bat, I'd have a lot less stress, a lot less worry 
a lot less fear. I would want to live a more holy life. I would want to live up to the calling. It would change everything. So one through three, calling of the disciple, four through six, the conduct of the disciple, six, 10 on the conflict of the disciple. Now, what I want to do is just go through a few highlights of the really just the, the wonderful passages that we find in Ephesians. And the first thing I want to do is share with you two prayers that we find in Ephesians chapter one and Ephesians chapter three. And I'm going to put these up on the, on the board so that you can see these. I want you to feel, I want you to receive the richness of these two letters. By the way, if you ever want to pray for me, pray these prayers. And if you ever find yourself in a position where you know you're going to be praying at a wedding reception or a cocktail party or a Bible study meeting or church, whatever it is, just go to these two prayers and incorporate them into your prayer. These, these are so rich. So let's just read them. Ephesians 1.15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And here's what his prayers look like. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Oh, the ultimate, to know him better. Verse 18, I listen to the beauty of this. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. The eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the confident expectation, that's what hope means in the biblical language, the confident expectation to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. My friend, we could just meditate on that prayer. Do we need anything else? But it gets better. Or he adds to it. Chapter 3, 14, verse 14. For this reason, and all these reasons that beforehand are your, your, your calling, your position in the kingdom of God. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering in, excuse me, I'm reading the, verse, the very first one. I thought it sounded familiar. And they are similar. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Wow. Just meditate on that. Reflect on that. Spend some time on that. This is absolutely the richest language I can imagine. And what we're doing right now, just remind you, we're just hitting some highlights. So while we are here, I want to show you how he concludes this great prayer in Ephesians 3. And I use this so often in weddings, and I even use it in funerals. I use it, I use it with people that, that are struggling. It's, it's just one of these quintessential passages. Ephesians 3, 20, now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Let's just stop there. Now to him. Jesus, God, our Heavenly Father, who is able to do immeasurably, abundantly more than all we ask or even imagine to ask for. Your Heavenly Father, through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit's power, wants you to have the most incredible life possible, and he's designed you for that life. We're the only ones getting in the way of that life that he has for us. Now, to be sure, your incredible life with, with Jesus in the kingdom may, will, will look different than mine, and yours may look like there are more feasts than there are fast, as C.S. Lewis would say, but it's still going to be the best life ever imaginable. The real point is he's, his, his richness, his love is lavished on us in such a way that we cannot even imagine to ask. C.S. Lewis makes the observation 
that God has to, God the Father has to be disappointed. It's not that we ask too much of him, it's we ask too little. We expect too little from him. C.S. Lewis says it's like we're children playing in a mud pile, making mud pies when a day at the beach is right down the street. No, to him who's able to do immeasurably abundantly more than all we ask or we could even imagine ask according to his power that is at work within us. To, hit, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So Ephesians is packed with these two incredible prayers. As we move to chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, then we get another one that I'm sure you have heard from time to time. It's one of the, another one of these, as I tell you, as I will keep repeating myself, Ephesians is just packed full, chock full of these incredible passages. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works for him, which he prepared in advance for us to do. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, through trust, through surrender, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's craftsmanship, we are God's workmanship, we are God's creation. He created us through Jesus Christ to do good works, which he has already prepared in advance for you to do. He's just waiting on you to, to open up and want to do the things he has prepared for you. You know, that word, we are God's handiwork, we are God's workmanship. In the Greek, it's fine craftsmanship. You are fine craftsmanship, the way you were designed by your heavenly father. There's nothing off the rack about you. You are custom designed, and he has this life for you. And we see that right there in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. When we get to chapter 3, verse 6, he tells us about the mystery, and he's writing to these Gentiles, and he says this, this mystery is that, is that through the gospel of the Gentiles, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharing together in the promise of Jesus Christ. See, that was a mystery. That was something no one understood. No one saw that coming. The Jews understood there was a Messiah coming, that he would bring all of them or bring them into the kingdom was their understanding and restore the glory of Israel. They never, ever would have conceived that that would include the Gentiles. So Paul is writing to these Gentiles in Ephesus. He's saying, you're no second-class citizen. You're full-on adopted into the family of Jesus, into the kingdom of God, with all the rights of any child. Now, we get to chapter four, and we get a little, God starts meddling a little bit in chapters four and chapter five. He's talking about the way we want to live this out, and he, and he, he mentions anger. Holy Spirit, through Paul, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and, and do not give the devil a foothold. See, the devil will get a foothold if you go to bed angry. But in your anger, do not sin. Apparently, we can be angry and not sin. Jesus was going through the temple, rampaging, throwing over the money changers tables, freeing up all the animals. Yes, he was angry. But he did not sin. But let me throw this caution out. I have failed completely. Completely, 100%. There, I'm sure there's never been a time in my life that I was righteously angry and there was no sinning going on in my heart. No condemnation, no judgment. Come on. Perhaps we can grow deeper and deeper and move deeper and deeper in the kingdom so that we can perhaps one day have righteous anger, but not sin in our anger. Then in, in the same chapter, verse four, excuse me, chapter four, verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. What Paul has just given us a list of things that we are not to do. Remember, chapters four through six is about the conduct of the believer, the disciple, the follower of Jesus. So when we, when we do the things that the Holy Spirit tells us not to do, do not live this way. Do not make that choice, Sam. Do not go to that place. Do not drink that. Do not smoke that. Do not take that drug. Do not do these things, these amoral things. When we do them anyway, judge, condemn, whatever it is, we are grieving the Spirit of God. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we see about do not quench the fire of the Holy Spirit. That word quench is like dousing water on a flame. 
when we quench the Holy Spirit's fire, then we're not doing what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do. Sam, write that letter, send that check, go see that person, spend time with them. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we do what he clearly, we know in our heart he's telling us not to do. We quench the Holy Spirit's fire when we refuse to do what clearly in our heart we know he is telling us to do. And we, living in the kingdom, you can have these red lights and green lights and caution lights straight from the Holy Spirit. But isn't it interesting that we can grieve the Holy Spirit of God? The Holy Spirit, who is the only God left on earth, has feelings, and we can grieve him. Now, as we move towards the finish of this, just highlights of the letter to the Ephesians, I'm going to get into a place where the Lord really starts to meddle. And you ladies, I'm going to start right off the bat. You're not going to like this because what you've heard is wives submit to your husbands. And I have run across very few ladies, wives who like that passage. And so, so many have said, I don't like Paul because Paul tells me to submit to my husband and my husband's a sorry old guy and I'm not submitting to him or, or why would I submit to him? And that's, that's so old fashioned and that's so old Testament or whatever you want to say. That's taken completely out of context, completely out of context. So let's actually look at what this, what, and of course, it's not Paul that's saying it, it's the Holy Spirit through Paul. So if you want to jump on Paul, stop and just start raising Cain with your heavenly father, with Jesus about this. But if we actually looked at what is said here and how it is said, I think I can shift your perspective a little bit. And man, I'm going to hammer you too. Very, very first thing we see in Ephesians 5, 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, not out of reverence for the other, but out of reverence for Christ. So if I'm sitting down, in a, which I don't do mixed groups anymore, but when I have in the past, couple groups, and this comes up as it very often does in a Q&A setting, I'll say, ladies, let me, let me set this up and, and present this in a way, and then you tell me what your response would be. So you have a husband who loves to submit to your way who loves to do things your way. Now, man, you know what our problem is? We think we know the right way. We think we know the efficient way. And we butt our heads up against our wives wanting our way. It's just that simple. And maybe it is more efficient. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it is a better way, but maybe it's not. But we want our way. What if you were the kind of husband who said, you know what, I'm, I love for my wife to have her way. I want, her, I want to do it my wife's way every time she wants to do it anyway. I'm delighted to do it your way, sweetheart. No, no, ladies. You have a husband who out submits you. He out submits you. He says, let's do it your way. Let's go see that movie. Let's watch that Hallmark movie instead of the action movie. Let's go to that restaurant. I didn't really want to go. I'd rather go eat chicken wings and beer, whatever it is. You have a husband who out submits you. Now let's go down to verse 25 through 27 through 28, actually, which we see the Holy Spirit saying, husbands, you love your wife so much that you're willing to die for them that you'll take a bullet for him, that you'll protect, you love your wife so much, so richly, so deeply, so unconditionally, and your family, your children, that any hint at harm, and you're stepping in front. Now, ladies, you have a husband who submits to you far more than you ever submit to him, loves to submit to you, loves to do it your way. You have a husband who you know loves you so much and values you so much that his automatic response is to step in front of you and, and take the bullet. He will always protect you and the children. Now in that setting, in the rare instance, the rare occasion where the two of you cannot come to terms on an important decision and your husband says, I feel like I'm going to take my position as spiritual leader on this one and, and I want to, we're going to do it my way. In that setting, would you be willing to submit to your husband in that setting? And I've yet to find, I, I would really be disappointed to find a woman whose heart was so hard. And what that, if her heart was that hard, it was probably because her husband hardened it like that way. He's not one of these men. <laughs> in addition to this, over the years, I have asked men who I know have been married 25, 35, 40 years. How many times in your marriage 
did you find yourself in this situation where you and your wife on an important decision could not come to an agreement and you said, I feel like I have to take position here and, and insist we do it my way. How many times has that happened? The most I've ever received is once. They would say, yeah, I think that might have happened once. Most of the time it's never happened. So let's not take this out of context and let's not get all worked up about it. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. But then the Holy Spirit continues with Paul, leave and cleave. For this reason, I'm quoting Genesis, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. You see, the context and culture of that statement is a man did not leave his father and mother. The woman, the wife, the young wife left her family to go live in the family household of her husband. So what are we to take from this? I believe that your heavenly father is so sensitive and understands human nature so much that he's telling the husband, look, you're taking this young girl away from her family. I want you to, to, to love her so deeply that it feels as if you have left your own father and mother. She is number one in your life. The family does not take precedence over her. She is it. I want you to love her that way. Isn't that incredible? And then to top it all off, we get this unbelievable observation, this insight into the human heart. However, each of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, talking to the husbands, and the wife must respect her husband. Love and respect. Love and respect. It's how we're wired. Men need to be respected by their wives. Wives need to be loved by their husbands. Unconditionally, deeply. Yes, a man wants to be and needs to be loved by his wife. And yes, of course, a wife wants to be and needs to be respected by her husband. But your primary oxygen lifeline, what keeps you alive emotionally and spiritually, what thrives in a marriage is the, the husband feels respected and the wife feels loved. And uh, Edgar Egerich has a book called Love and Respect. And you should look, look him up online either get the book, get whatever you, resources you can get, or Google or YouTube some of his, some of his talks, because he does, a, he's hilarious the way he does it, he does a fantastic job of setting this up, but what is clear is that you get into this crazy cycle where the husband doesn't, well, let's start with this, the wife doesn't feel loved, so she doesn't respect the husband, the husband doesn't feel respected, so he's not going to show love to his wife, and just look at this in your own life, and in your own marriage, and in the marriages around you, and you'll see when there's a problem, that is typically the problem. Love and respect. Now, I want to finish with an observation about Ephesus. We're going to leave the letter to the Ephesians. We're going to go, to, go back to Acts, where we find Paul's journey into Ephesus, and what we're going to see here is what I call the absolute microcosm of the Southern Church. I'm from the South, the Southeast. Everyone you know around here is a Christian. They're not, but they go to Christian churches. Very few of them know anything about the Holy Spirit. Their preachers don't know anything about the Holy Spirit, so they don't preach about the Holy Spirit. They're not born again. They're churchians, not Christians. And this is the passage that just captures it absolutely perfectly. Acts 18, verse 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, who we see in their other places in the New Testament, was an incredible warrior for the kingdom, an incredible evangelist for the kingdom. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, remember one of those top three cities, Alexandria, Ephesus, and Antioch, Alexandria, Egypt, came to Ephesus. Now listen to this description. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures, that's really good so far. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately. If you want to introduce me that way, I'll take that all day long. But look what comes next. Though, though, if my wife, Dina, were to say to me after a talk, I loved what you had to say. That was so great. You know, you were right on time. You were right online. You were just, that was really great. However, but though, 
I'm likely not going to hear anything, remember anything she said before that. And all I'm going to remember is what she says after that. Everything now has been canceled out by this though. Though he knew only the baptism of John. Clearly a deficiency. He's got all these other great things. And he taught about Jesus accurately. The facts about Jesus. Though he knew only the baptism of John. Remember John said, what was his key word? Repent, repent, repent. Change your behavior. Change the way you're living. Too many people decide to get back into church or get back into Bible studies or men's groups or ladies Bible studies and, and it feels warm and fuzzy and it feels good and so now they're back and they're Christians and all they've got is the baptism of John. They quit smoking, drinking, sex, rock and roll, whatever it is that's, that's clearly making their life more difficult, not helpful, not beneficial. They cut that out and they think they've made such great progress. Verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Priscilla and Aquila heard him. Those are two dear friends, husband and wife, dear friends of Paul's, companions of Paul's, great evangelists in the first century. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. We clearly can pick up that they actually told him about the Holy Spirit, not the facts about Jesus, but being born again, which Jesus insisted you had to do to even see the kingdom of God, much less enter it. Now let's pick it up at chapter 19, verse 1. While Apollos was in Corinth, so he had left Ephesus, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. This magnificent city, 250,000 people, these incredible temples, this incredible stadium, theater, 25,000 people, the crown jewel of the Roman Empire. There he found some disciples. So he's in Ephesus and he comes up on these men. And they're like us. They just left a Bible study. They probably have a Bible in their hand, modern day setting. And so they're clearly identifying themselves as Christians. Turns out they're really only churchmen because they only heard from Apollos half the story. There he found some disciples and he asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, when you surrendered your life? And they answered, no, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Now, you've heard of the Holy Spirit, but you probably don't really know the Holy Spirit. That's not your fault. So Paul asked him, well, what baptism did you receive? And they replied, John's baptism. And Paul says, okay, I get it now. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance to change the way you live. There's no transformation there. There's just change. He told the people to believe, to trust, to surrender in the one coming after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. About 12 men in all. I wonder if that's a coincidence. See, this just captures Paul's experience in Ephesus. These men had a change in their lifestyle. And they opened up to the facts about Jesus, but they weren't born again and did not receive the Holy Spirit. Don't get hung up on the spoken tongues thing. Look at the fact that they received the Holy Spirit. So my friend, that's Ephesus. That's, that's the book of Ephesians, the letter to the family of followers in that city of Ephesus. Rich, rich, lavish language and love from our Heavenly Father. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you'll this will compel you to spend more time in this letter to the Ephesians. Grace and peace be with you. Remember, there's more. There's always more. You know it. So come and find it.